Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight. Can everybody hear me okay in the back and the side? All right. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I'm so excited, I'm so excited at this turnout. This is fun for us all, fun for Tacoma. Um, I think it's really a testament to the importance of this conversation, the timeliness of it, to see so many um, faces here tonight at Odin Brewing, so thank you. Um, real quick, I'm Christine, in case you were wondering. Uh, she, Christine Sherrod, I'm the food reporter for TNT Diner at the Tacoma News Tribune. Uh, I've been there for about, com just coming up on three years. Um, it's been a fascinating, challenging, strange, exciting three years, um, <laughs> given the circumstances. But uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, thanks also to Odin for hosting us. Um, thanks, 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 Odin. Uh, and this, in this very cool space, view of the bay and all of that, uh, lots of you have drinks. If you want a drink, don't hesitate to pop up and go get another one from the bar. And if you did order food, I believe, yeah, they've been delivering it back here. So um, feel free to do that and they'll bring it to you. So cool. All right. Well, without further ado, yeah, pop right over. You're good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what I, we like to see. Okay. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. I'll introduce um, the three folks with me tonight. Um, first up, I have Deanna Harris Bender. Yeah. <laughs> what a crowd. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see if you guys can top that. Um, she is the chef and owner of Over the Moon Cafe in Opera Alley. It's been there for 22 whole years, which is a huge testament, a huge piece. And I'm so thankful to have her here. I w w asked her to be part of this, um, really to have that kind of veteran perspective. I mean, she's literally watched the, the world change around her over those 22 years, and especially Tacoma. Um, so I'm thankful to have her perspective here tonight. Uh, and next to her, I have Chef Reginald Jacob Howell from Obama. <laughs> also brought an entourage with him tonight. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have him here. And Rama's one of my favorite restaurants in town. And I just love the energy that he brings. He's a born and raised Tacoman, which is pretty sweet also. <laughs> So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. And then next to him, I have Sam Halhuli. He is, wow. woo! <laughs> and he is the uh, owner and bar pro, I like to say, of the Mule Tavern in South Tacoma, right in the heart of South Tacoma Way. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's just one of those bars that just kind of like has everything that you want. It's like a great neighborhood tavern. It feels like it's been there forever even though it's been a few years. Um, so I'm grateful to have his perspective, both from South Tacoma and also from kind of like a little bit more of the bar side of things. So, um, so all right, here we are. We will get started. <laughs> so I'd like to start with you, Deanna, um, not to put you on the first spot, but given that over the Moon has been open for 22 years, which is such a feat. Um, I'd like for you to kind of just like paint the picture for us a little bit of what, you're sighing, paint the picture of what Tacoma was like at that time, it was 2001, um, what the restaurant scene was like, and where you kind of saw what you started doing at Over the Moon at that time, fitting into the time. I'm gonna pass the mic. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Nice to know. So 20, oh gosh, that was such a long time ago. So um, there were several small places, but Tacoma was kind of a food wasteland at the time, unfortunately. We had this, you know, tried and trues, the Stanley and Seaforks, you know, the Cliff House, that kind of stuff. But what I was trying to do, and uh, we had Charlie from Primo Grill, had just opened, I think, a year or two before I did. Um, <clears throat> The Italian restaurant, he just sold Alfredo Europa Bistro, opened in Proctor. So there was just new little places kind of, you know, chef-driven were opening up around the time <clears throat> that I opened. And my 
motivation was I traveled to San Francisco and they had Maiden Lane there and there was all these little, you know, kind of cafe, restaurant, bistro things. Um, Marzano's was like my favorite place. Eliza just has done a great job there. So she was part of my inspiration as well. Um, so we were just kind of on the edge. Downtown was just horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we didn't have the glass museum. We didn't have, you know, any of that stuff. Um, and I stumbled upon this space in Opera Alley that Ruby and George Chambers were involved with. And uh, I kept hearing, because I was looking for different spaces in the area. Proctor was just kind of a, you know, that was a no-brainer because it was such a cute little spot. But I was really trying to look for something a little more city feel, which downtown had. And everybody kept telling me I was crazy. Um, but, you know, hey, you're going to go, you're going to do something, you may as well just jump right in. And that's really the vision I had for my restaurant. And uh, so I found this little spot in this little alley and thought, well, at least it won't be on the kind of beaten path. So I'll have a little bit of time to get my craft together. Because <laughs> uh, I had not been in the industry for a long time. Anyway, so that's a little bit of my story. Wonderful, wonderful. And I mean, 22 years later, you're still, still there, still hidden, kind of. It's still... It, 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 it's it's pretty amazing how it still can feel like something that you just like stumbled into, even if you've been there before, and you, it totally still has that clout. Um, still a hard reservation to get on the weekends, all of that. Don't want to mess with trying to find a seat at a 30-seat restaurant on a Saturday like that. So. <laughs> um, so moving on to you, Jacob, um, I'd like to kind of compare that with your experience I know you weren't at Rama at the very, very beginning, but shortly thereafter. Um, so kind of compare that, like what was it like being a part of a restaurant like Enrama in 2017, 2018, when it opened? How different was it? How did the city kind of take to what you guys are doing there? Um, so yeah, I think I, I was there early in Enrama before we had like our our feelers for what Tacoma was ready for. And I think that's always kind of been like the thought there is like, how far can we push the limits, you know? Um, so we were, you know, doing a couple fresh pastas, small plates, um, still figuring out what Tacoma wanted, you know? So being there during that developing stage, it kind of, from my previous job, I was at DOA first and then Moshi Moshi when they first opened up. So I did like the turn and burn, then I moved into the fine dining stuff, but also then and in Rama, it was like a different kind of like, oh, they're doing stuff from scratch. You know, we're, we're making bread, we're, you know, starting sauces from, you know, the, the root type of deal. So that, that was like where I was like first, like, this is a spot that has potential, especially from growing up in Tacoma. Like, you know, you have your, for me, it was more soul food. I, I have memories for that. But in Rama, it was just like a different breed at the time. Um, so being a part of that de development stage and then like as a, as a cook kind of developing myself, it... It, yeah, it's opened a lot of doors, a lot of like, a lot of feelers for you know what the industry has to offer and what Tacoma has to offer. So, um, it, it, you know, I kind of, even though I left a few times to kind of explore, um, kind of like a lot of food adventures in Rama's always stayed steady with like, just pushing the limits. So just just continuing to be a part of that, um, and just the things we're doing now is like it's pretty dope and just see where it's come. But um, we're still figuring it out, and every day we're changing. Um, we are a scratch kitchen, so. Um, very seasonal. The things we're doing is like we're changing it daily. We're improving on the minute, um, and that, that's the fun part about it, you know. So, yeah. But it, yeah, it's it's, it's hella fun. Awesome. <laughs> Just real quick, the term scratch kitchen is always kind of a funny term yeah, in, the, yeah. in the world. Sometimes if you go out, you'll hear some places will toss it around, and it's often not totally true. Like they're not making they're not making bread there sometimes, right? Sometimes it's true, like in Rama's case, but yeah, yeah. it's hard to do that. It is, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, um, I, I think we're not afraid to push, like I said, push the limits. So making bread every day is a challenge. Someday your bread proof is, someday it doesn't. You gotta start over, you need bread an hour, and it takes two. Um, that's the fun part. That, that's why we do what we do. But, um, you know, yeah, come by, try our bread. It's, 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 it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. 
Testament, the burger, which I know like it's like you guys started selling a burger, Jordan. Yeah, like we get, it's a burger at a pasta spot. Like you, where are you gonna find that at? So um, yeah. Um, awesome. <laughs> And Sam, so similar question for you. I sort of mentioned this earlier, but something that I love about the mule is that it feels like it's been there forever. And it was a bar dating back to like the early 20th century, I think, Oasis, if I remember correctly. Yeah, like the 30s was, it was like the Oasis beer parlor, and then the Oasis tavern, then the Oasis, and then I sadly changed the name. <laughs> Mostly because I didn't live in Tacoma before I opened it, so nobody knew me. And so I felt like I wanted to give it a new name just so that people who were driving down that street were like, oh, that's new. Mm -hmm. But you nailed it. The goal, uh, I had Chris Sharp, who a lot of people know, do my sign. And literally the discussion was, I want this sign to look new to anyone who knew it before. I want it to look old to anyone who's never seen it before. I want it to look like it belonged there. And he nailed that. Yeah, very cool. And so you, you mentioned that you're from the region. You lived in New Orleans for a while, um, where a lot of his cocktail expertise comes from. Not a bad place to have spent some time. Uh, but why, why was South Tacoma the place for the kind of bar you've created? It, it's, a, it's a hard answer because I didn't know South Tacoma before I got to South Tacoma. Um, the, do you regret it? No, absolutely not. The, the, unromantic, the unromantic answer is, is that it was where I could afford to, to be. Um, I was looking all over, I looked at Aberdeen and, and Everett, and I mean, I probably, if I had unlimited funds, probably would have landed in Bellingham where I cut my teeth bartending and where I went to college. So um, I grew up in Seattle, then to Bellingham, back to Seattle. And that's when I went to New Orleans. And at that point, before I went to New Orleans, everyone was talking about Tacoma. So when this bar came up on Craigslist, um, I came down and visited it and drove down South Tacoma Way. And I don't know, I was just immediately in love with all the old signage, all the old neon, which is one of my biggest regrets. And changing the name is that I pulled the neon out of that sign. So that's, it's still, still sitting in my attic. And I just look at it sometimes and want to cry because it's so expensive and so classic to have beautiful neon. but. Um, I loved South Tacoma. The only question that I had was whether um, South Tacoma and Tacoma in general would accept what we were doing because it was definitely going to be different than especially what South Tacoma was doing. I mean, we're, we're, we're an LGBTQ plus safe space. We're doing craft cocktails in a dive bar. You know what I mean? So are people going to walk in and, and just want to, you know, order, you know, AMFs and, and Budweiser bottles? And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I wanted to do from my heart. So uh, the answers to all those is, of course, yes, it worked out. It's been amazing. The, the strip went from, my, the term I probably would have used the most if you came in the bar and talked to me at the beginning was vacant blight. So to come away was, there was not even for rent signs. There was no for sale signs. It was just empty buildings. And now they're all flipping, they're all occupied. And there was a lot of young entrepreneurs coming in and doing stuff down there that's amazing. Yeah, and in no small part, I think, to what you've created there, right? To take a chance on a place like that takes a lot of risk on your part and uh, to like hope it hope it pays off and it I mean even in I've been here for three years and it looks different than it did when I got here credit where credit is due the owners gave me an owner carried loan which they didn't need to do I would have never gotten a loan somebody who uh, I think one of their kids had built a room in essentially an attic above the space where I lived for two years Safe. so my risk was relatively low because I just ate my own sandwiches and and <laughs> you know <laughs> Drank that so ginger beer that was morning. part of the appeal was I, I like literally was squatting in my own business for over two years <laughs> which made it help make it successful and help us grow over time and now you know I bought a house and I have a dog now so it's great success um, so that transitions nicely to, I wanted to stick with you, Sam, and I don't want to spend too much time harping on the thing that happened. Um, yeah, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm going to try not to say the word, but I did want to touch on it a little bit. And uh, I often recall this conversation that I had with you in, it was April 2020, like early in April, and like I was in a dark place. I was taking walks alone at night and like crying. It was fine, except it wasn't fine. We're all fine, I guess. <laughs> but it, it was, and I wasn't even in the position that I, that you guys all were, right? Having to 
potentially lay off staff that you had hired and sort of nurtured for, in Deanna's case, like a really long time, in your case for a few years. But I remember talking to you and you just sounded so positive and you had kind of just took the moment and you looked at it and you said, okay, how can I do what I'm doing, but in a completely different way? And for anybody who has no idea what I'm talking about, just briefly, he makes ginger beer tonic on site um, it's addictive if you haven't had it. And he always, you were always selling it in growlers, but once the pandemic started, he started really kind of focusing on that and then making all these other things, like making this old fashioned syrup that you could just mix with whiskey at home and it made this like perfect old fashioned, just like you were at the bar. Um, and I just loved that ingenuity. And I remember you saying, I can't imagine that there won't be businesses that are permanently changed by this. And that was, ended up being very prescient because it was very early and it lasted a long time, right? So I'd like to ask you, um, how now looking at it, how has that whole experience changed you and changed the bar and changed how you kind of view being that neighborhood tavern? Sure, I'd say it's changed things uh, functionally in a, in a couple of ways. Um, one way is that, you know, we have some things on the menu now that just wouldn't have existed before uh, from, you know, on the on the on the lighter side, like we uh, started making housemates sours. We make a salted lime sour and a honeyed lemon sour. And that was because we wanted to give some people something that they could take home when we started being able to serve full bottles. So we just needed something to make a profit off of. And really, we weren't making a ton of profits. It was mostly so that anyone who was behind the bar was actually making some tips because everyone that came down was insanely generous and on to go things you know we're tipping 20 percent or more so that was actually sustaining a lot of the people that were coming back to work that um that weren't being you know were, that weren't being or couldn't be taken care of by unemployment uh, which did a great job at least from my small experience with my small staff my staff was mostly well taken care of until they did uh, come back to work due to pp loans and everything like that which were helpful um so that that's one thing that changed the other thing that changed uh which i'm I don't want to say embarrassed about, but we started serving doubles just because it, it started being where like, like before, when? I, mean, I like never when? I never pushed doubles before. I was like, oh, once they're in control, you know, you don't over serve. And, and I mean, we just still didn't over serve, but it was kind of like COVID was just like, you want a double? Like, let's have fun now. You know? And they, they're, you know, it's, a, it's in a ball jar. It feels normal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> awesome. um, I think actually uh, something I thought of, and I don't know if uh, it's, totally was but when you mentioned having to close, I think that's the thing that I, I actually like the most right now is I don't feel the pressure to be open every day anymore. If I have, I mean, before COVID, I had an opinion that like, if you were sick, you don't come to work. I mean, obviously that's number one, it's the law, but it's definitely not often enough the uh, standard in our industry that you don't come to work sick. And, it, and I'm, I'm privileged as well, I'm privileged in a lot of ways, um, but that I have a small staff, so, you know, if one person's sick, I might disappoint one person or ask the other person, hey, do you want to open for a half day or do you want the day off? They'll go, I'll have the day off. And we'll just post a sign, hey, we have a staff shortage for today. We're going to close for the day. And that's, you know, it's not like when you have a big, big place with a lot of moving parts, one person out, it screws everyone over. And, you know, not everyone can has the privilege to take a day off. But I do love personally that I think we are taking those steps where we can go, hey, health is more important, life is more important, and we're gonna close for the day. And you get at least a little bit of, you might have gotten it before, but now I think we think as owners and, and operators that we have that grace to like actually be able to close for the day. And I think that's a huge change, you know, that we're respecting workers more, we're, you know, we're paying workers better, and all of those things are, um, you know, I think are changes that COVID did actually create. So for anybody wondering why a place is closed, that's why. <laughs> At least that's the excuse. Yeah. <laughs> and for a million other reasons, right? Which we'll talk a little bit about too. Um, so sort of similar for you, Deanna. Um, you know, no restaurant, sort of to what Sam was just saying, no restaurant is built for not having people in it or a bar or a coffee shop. It's literally, that's the reason it exists, right? That's why we're here. Um, and you said to me at one point that, you know, it was in a dark time too, but you said it's small, it's different, and word of mouth, that's like, that's what has kept me going for all these years. At the time it was not quite at 22, so you're still here, it's still a couple years later. Um, you had this sense of trust in your product and your service, and it also seemed like you had this trust in your customers, and you said like, if they like it, they'll come back. 
Um, so I'd like to ask you, after 22 years of counting, which I feel like I've said a lot, but it's just a really long time to be still running a restaurant, kudos, um, and even more in the industry, what, what are your biggest takeaways from the past few years? Will things like curbside pickup and takeout, will they continue to be important, or is, was that just like a blip in the radar? For me, it was very much a blip in the radar. Um, you know, being fine dining, we're all about atmosphere. Um, so it's when you come into Over the Moon, it's the food, that you, the, it's the service, it's the atmosphere, it's the feeling. What I tried to create from the get-go was a place where people can come in and just check everything at the door and have some peace, you know, and have a relationship with the person that they're sitting across for. Um, so that, to me, that's the epitome of what Over the Moon is. Um, so having, being closed for a period of time, and I too came to understand that, I think for a lot of us in this industry too, because we all know that this industry can be very challenging um, for employees, for owners, for you know all of us. Um, and there's this sense of we have to be available all the time, which I learned really early on that that's not true. Um, we can, it's the art of saying, the fine art of saying no. Um, we have limitations. And I think this closure that we all experienced, I, I know for me it hammered that home that quality of life is much bigger than a dollar. Um, and experience, and that's, that's what I do every day. Is, it's all about moments. It's all about moments instead of fiscally, you know, and all that kind of stuff, that bottom line. The, if you take care of people, they'll take care of you, and I've learned that throughout my 22 years, and so that's what we strive to do at Over the Moon. They took care of me, and it makes me want to cry because my customers took care of me. Um, so I got that tenfold back when we closed. Um, and so I tried my best to give back to my employees that have been with me for so long and supported my vision and supported me in that. Um, so we kind of all took care of each other. But I made that decision to do takeout food, which we're not set up for. And the grace that people were shown, showing us in that. And it was basically me and my daughter. And my daughter's worked for me um, probably 17 years. Uh, she grew up there. Both my kids grew up there. Anyway, so that's, long story short, um, <laughs> so it's a long story for sure. But uh, so we did take out. I did some really cool stuff. Um, it took a lot of energy to do that because, again, it's just me and my kiddo there doing it. But I get, the grace that I was shown was amazing. It was just really, truly amazing. Thank you. I, yeah. Thanks to that. There were so many times that, like, I, again, I didn't even have the... I wasn't even in this kind of position, but there were times that I was like on the phone with somebody and crying. So I don't like let me not cry too much. <laughs> but it is it is really emotional and something that I I heard from so many people that are up here with me today and so many other people who I spoke with over the course of three years was that like you might think that it was somehow easier, but it was ten million times more difficult. They were working so much harder than they had ever worked in their whole lives, I think, doing the jobs of 17 people. And I think, you know, sometimes, maybe not everybody in this room, because you all probably care about it in a different way, but there's definitely people out there who forget that. Don't forget that, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so, Jacob. You next, sort of on this topic, but a little bit, maybe looking a, a little bit differently. So, incidentally, you had just decided to take a job in Seattle right before kind of everything started. Yeah, good and bad, bittersweet. I <laughs> Listen. So, I'd like to ask you, you know, you're from here, we discussed that, but 
you were there, you were working up there for a couple of years. You came back to Tacoma. Why? I never, I never left. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I, I left and um, I think at the time as, you know, um, I was growing into my like, my culinary career, I was like wanting to, you know, lead, lead my own brigade, you know, so um, I was just exploring options and just, you know, at the time, you know, my wife now, Sabrina here, um, she lived in, a, <laughs> she lived in Seattle too, so I was like finding a way to try to be closer to her and this job popped up and I'm like, you know, it's a good opportunity to spread my wings see if I'm actually ready and fit for this industry and um, the longevity of it. So I took a job out there and um, COVID happened like immediately. I think it was February and it came March. It was like, we're shutting down the world. And I was like, great, I just moved. Don't have money. Um, we opened up for a little bit, you know, we adapted quickly and uh, we were at a high volume uh, restaurant. It was called Bongo's out in uh, Green Lake. Um, so we were already accommodated to the to-go situation. So it kind of transitioned a little easier. So I was able to see that, that quick adjustment of, uh, we're just doing strictly takeout, um, no people in, pick up at the curb type of deal. Um, that was a blessing for me because um, I was like, I learned how to adjust and like, just I figured out the business pretty quick. And it was like, you know, my first head chef job. And I'm like, all right, well, this is what it is. You know, we're having a national or a global pandemic. This is a test of my life, you know? So it was more of opportunity to dive in and, and um, really see how business works and see what it takes to survive in the dire knees and all these situations. Um, and then I moved over to Capitol Hill for a little bit after that. Um, and then um, Chris called me here. He was like, hey man, you know, we got a good opportunity for you here. And he knew I, I, I love Rama and I'm from Tacoma. Um, and you know, as a Tacoma kid, you want, you want to represent the city. You want to, you know, make it and lead, lead by example. And for me, like to work in Tacoma um, in a fine dining establishment and being, you know, um, somebody who didn't go to culinary school and have a lot of rep, a huge resume, and to get the opportunity, I was like, I'm absolutely ready for it, you know? Um, especially with COVID, um, I, opened, I actually opened up my own business after Seattle didn't kind of work out. It was, uh, it was like a private chef business. Yeah, private chef business, you know? And um, the, world was, the world was in a fritz and people were afraid to leave their homes. So I took what I, what I knew and loved to do to their homes. Um, and so I, that opened up my private chef business a lot. Um, and there, you're, you're seeing the struggles that a restaurant goes through daily with supply chain issues, um, running out, you know, find, trying to find, like, beef. I think beef jumped up, you know, too much. So we're, you know, looking for food. You're looking new ways to cook, um, exploring different cuisines, things like that. So it was a good opportunity, you know, um, to, to experience that. I would say it was, you know, it was tough. It was a hell of a time to, you know, change jobs. But, uh, you know, for us industry folks, like, we, we don't let people know we're sweating and we're drowning. Um, end of the day, you won't know the difference unless we, you know, tell you personally, like, hey, you know, we had one, one burner back there, no oven, and, you know, <laughs> but we pushed, we pushed out this food, you know, like, it, it happens, it happens, but, you know, we'll never let you know, we're going to smile, and that's the joy of it, is, you know, we're, we're telling the story, whether you know it or not, um, so the food you're eating is, is, is you know, there's, there's always a story, it's not always written, but it's being wrote at the time, so that's, that's the beauty, but, yeah, coming back to Nrama was dope, and, um, I think for, for us, we were a small, small restaurant, always been a small restaurant, trying to, you know, pack as many people as possible and give them, you know, the hell of experience. But um, COVID, you know, put a few things on the menu, like the burger. Mm -hmm. um, we started doing to-go meals. Um, we changed our liquor license, so we're actually family-friendly now. So the kiddos can come to a certain extent. We also have an adult, you know, section, 21 and up. But, um, you know, pivots like that for small places, um, People just, you got to move differently. You got to, you got to stay with what's what. And you can't complain about it. You just got to get it done. Um, and that's the beauty of it. But, you know, it's a good opportunity to just, just, just continue to learn. It keeps you on your toes more. You know, we're on our toes already as chefs and business owners and things like that. But COVID taught us to like, you know, you got to be on your tippy toes yeah. um, to, to, to get it done. But, you know, we're, we're here and we're, we're surviving. Um, and, you know, you, you'll never know when we're stressed. So, but it's a blessing. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. As I was saying, it's hard to yeah. <laughs> it's hard to wrangle hospitality people because they're so hospitable. Yeah, That's yeah, like and it's tough. Do. You know, you're trying to serve people yeah. when they, you really can. It's like, what do I do now? You know, there's no experience that you're you're exchanging. You know, so the to-go thing was a little, it was a little, a little different for me at least. I like to face to face talk to you about food, but yeah. 
give me in a bag and tell you to have a nice day is like a little different for me. So, <laughs> yeah. And that is sort of, I wanted to also ask you about transitioning to um, sort of some of those current challenges that you sort of touched on. Um, also for you, Jacob, to start here. And Rama is really small. Mm -hmm. You're lucky to be in this beautiful old building that has this kind of built-in outdoor yeah, area. Yeah which you know you just kind of suddenly started using but then you invested in it yeah, right yeah, there's yeah. parts of it that's covered there's lights there's a heater heaters and stuff now how to so sort of a two-part question how important do you think making those kinds of decisions is sort of in the long term and then also can you talk a little bit about what that really means in terms of running a restaurant that has this seasonal element to it that yeah. like literally doubles your capacity. Yeah, yeah, so from yeah. a staffing standpoint, from a, you know, I know you guys seem to be pretty good about it. Like if a storm suddenly rolls in and you have to cancel all the reservations yeah. for the people who were, you know, don't want to sit outside in, you know, blustery weather. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, to answer the first part, I think it's just investing in yourself or investing in your business, investing in the craft. You're gonna have to spend a dollar here and there. Um, the patio was, you know, we knew it was there, we knew it was gonna grow. Um, it's a matter if we could keep up with it. So over the time, you know, the weather, we know Washington, it rains the majority of the time, but you know, a little bit warmer lately has been giving us some, some good sun. But, uh, you know, we, you know it, 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 it's been growing slowly. It's, been, it's like been dope to watch, because like, it's just like small things, an extra table here, and it's like, oh, we can fit another table. Oh, we can fit five more, maybe six, seven, Chris. So, yeah, so there's, there's that, but you know, it's the investing in the, the awning up top. It's adjustable, it's movable, um, and we try to give the, you know, the guests the option if they want to sit inside and sit outside, and that's what COVID did. A lot of people were sitting outside. So the patio situation was inevitable. Um, in Seattle, you, you know, you see out the, on the side of the road, people got these just whatever they can put up for extra seating to make people more co comfortable. And that's like, you know, the investment part is like, how do you make your guests feel, you know, more at home, more comfortable? You, you know, you invest. Um, and that's the patio, you know, um, and not everybody's comfortable and think COVID's, you know, away and it's not, you know, we're still living in a world unknown, you know? So we have to, you know, make them feel comfortable, but also, you know, give them the, the same restaurant experience. Um, and it's not just, you know, patio, and you know, we're, we're giving great service out there. We set it up as much as possible. Um, but, you know, the weather permits per Washington might lose a few tables during, you know, a, a random day. Um, and we have to cancel some reservations. But people are, are, are more than understanding. They come back. Um, they come, you know, with more people. Um, and it's, it's, it's the process that you have to kind of understand. But with the staffing issues, you know, um, summer it gets, it gets pretty banging downtown Tacoma. With, with all the development and things like that, we're seeing a lot of traffic, um, which is good. Um, you know, it's new to some people, especially if, you know, somebody from Tacoma. It's, it's, it's a little scary to see, because you know, the town you grew up in is changing. Um, there's these people here that, you know, aren't from here, don't know the customs and the way we do things. And it's like, you hope they can, uh, you know, come in and invest in the community rather than come in to, you know, be a, you know, a puzzle piece doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. Um, so you're trying to accommodate that. But then also, you know, right now we're shut down our patio. We lost five tables. So, we, you know, we're losing a little bit of, um, not losing business, but we only so much we can handle as far as, if you've ever been in Rama, you know how small it is. Um, you know, we do our best to, to fit as much people, but um, with that, sometimes we have enough staff or we don't, or we're overstaffed and we're slow. So th there's, that, there's that gray area you got to like, you know, challenge into, you know, we know the situation with the world and we do our best to make sure people are able to take care of themselves their health, um, have a little money in their pocket, um, but also gain like, you know, basic skills to, to further themselves in whatever career they want to do. So that's what, that's what Enrama kind of is. We're, we're, we're evolving in those areas where people um, don't know they think, they, they don't know they need to evolve in. You know, we're there to offer that opportunity, um, which is dope. So um, it's difficult, it's an everyday thing. Like today, we had to close, unfortunately, yeah. uh, with the city issue. Um, it sucks to tell people, hey, I, you know, you can't come to work today, you know. Who doesn't need that, that, that day for that, that money? So that, that's the thing we're, we're, we're faced with daily. Um, and it's just, you know, it's an everyday challenge, but you have to just take it for what it is and accept it and um, run with it. And people, you know, everybody's more understanding now. We're, I think this world is slowly healing itself and we're able to like ask each other how we're doing. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, but um, that, that's, that's where we're at and where we're going and we're staying.
So, yeah. Complicated, but truthful answer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, and sort of moving to you, Sam, you, you sort of mentioned, you know, you have a t closely knit staff. You mentioned sort of how South Tacoma has changed. Um, where do you see it going, that area? There's going to be a bagel shop, guys. It's huge. The bagel shop, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there, I think there's a... Uh, three brand new businesses, one about to open, um, or two about to open and one just open. I mean, I guess I don't know where it's going. I guess I, I very much just feel along for the ride, um, but it seems to always just be going in positive directions. Um, I think that the, the question that I have about it, I, which isn't really a vision, but a question is whether that strip can sustain daytime business because we don't really have much of that. So that's like my only concern for the bagel shop, which I'm super excited about as well, like, because I want them to thrive is can we get people as, and I'm a South Tacoma resident. I live, you know, walking distance from the bar. And so I want, you know, I have a brand new friend that moved from Portland into the neighborhood. And she's like, I want to be able to like walk with my kid down to a coffee shop and, you know, get some, you know, afternoon lunch or whatever with my kid. And that would be a very cool development for that. So do I see that? I, I genuinely don't know, but that's what my hope is that those other alternative businesses, more than just the Knight District, will develop there. Because there doesn't seem to be any question about that right now. That's clearly being, um, panning out as being successful down there. Um, but, you know, I think you see it, like I kind of consider South Tacoma like the Georgetown, if you're familiar with Seattle, of. And Georgetown did take that turn where you started seeing coffee shops and stuff down there. So. Um, yeah, I think that that is the direction and the intention for what seems to be going on down there. Um, and there's definitely room for it. There's still empty businesses down yeah. there. And there's def there's a bunch of businesses that are for rent right now, mostly um, uh, blanking on the name of it right now. The real estate company, the oh, Millers. Theory. Theory, yeah. yeah. Theory has bought a lot of, and they're renting, a, and they do a good job of renovating down there. Yeah. Um, and, and they're really building that district a lot actively. So, you know, when they when those businesses get filled in, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But the hope is, is that it will develop into like a day and night time district. Right. Awesome. So this actually is perfect. Your answer for where I was going to take us next is how is there a fellow named Hal in the audience? I don't know if he, he didn't show up for his own extremely thoughtful question. So I'm going to ask it anyways from mysterious Hal, who's not here. Um, it, it, it's such a great question. I'm so glad that he asked it and that I'm going to ask you guys. Um, we'll transition a little bit to sort of audience questions, some of which I worked in, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for a couple live ones. Um, so I'm just going to ask it literally the way that he wrote it because it was almost perfect. To what degree does the availability and effectiveness of public transportation affect the success of Tacoma's restaurant scene? And what would help? Anybody can take this who's feeling adventurous. Well, I, I, I work downtown, so we're seeing that light rail kind of build. So I think that the traffic is good, but it's going to be new. It's going to be different. Um, but it, it essentially could be good if we, you know, learn to accept it. Um, but who knows? <laughs> you know, good traffic is good. But, you know, I grew up in Tacoma. You know, I think I said it three times, but if you didn't know, tack town. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd ride the bus from, you know, Pacific over to Foss. And so there was a lot more bus routes back then. And then to see it change, and then to see a light rail, I'm like, well, what's, what's the difference, you know? So it, it's, it's, it's weird. I, I feel like you'd have to ride a bus or like be a, you know, a frequent traveler, of like just any public kind of transportation. Um, but it, essentially, I, I think it's gonna be good for us. I think it's gonna be good for business. I think it's gonna bring a lot of new people um, especially for Tacoma, I'm all about, you know, putting this on the map. So I think a lot of people who haven't experienced a Tacoma restaurant or been out in Tacoma, um, I think it'd be good for them to see and get around easier. Or people, um, especially when you get to Tacoma and development there, we're getting a lot of new, a lot of students, a lot of people that are not from here. So I think allowing them um, to explore the city and have those, like, uh, you know, transportation options will be good, but, you know, who knows? You know, we're, we're, we're living in the unknown and we hope for the best and uh, that's, that's what we can do. All right. Does anybody else have thoughts on that? Sam from South Thank Tacoma. You for some time to think. <laughs> I have two thoughts. Um, so with us, especially being in South Tacoma and being a nightlife um, district, so when I, you know, my first instinct of public transportation was like, huh? 
Uh, but really, like, what it makes me think of is when people ask if we have a parking lot, which we don't, is I tell them, you shouldn't be driving here. So really, what I, you know, what it made me think of was uh, Uber and Lyft. So I mean, it's, it's really more of a question than a thought, which is, you know, the sustainability of, of Uber and Lyft, uh, the, the, you know, the cost effectiveness for drivers versus the profitability, sorry, the cost effectiveness for riders versus the profitability for drivers, keeping that in balance. Like I was just in New Orleans and I could get a car really cheaply, really quickly, which is gonna encourage me to use it more. Whereas, I don't know about anyone else, but I've had a really hard time um, getting Ubers and Lyfts in, in town. So, I mean, if you wanna remove the, the driver business side of it, just as a customer who's wanting to go, you know, I have a lot of people that come down to South Tacoma and say, I'm sorry, I haven't been here in so long. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's, it's, it's two Ubers. It's, it's an additional $40 to your day, if not more than that, especially if you want to make more than one stop. Now you're spending a lot just, just in safe transportation, which you should insist on when you drink, right? So, you know, the, if we can get that cost to the point where it's profitable for drivers, so it's really more of a series of spontaneous questions that I don't know that I have the capacity of an answer to, but it's what it makes me think of. And then the second thing it makes me think of is, and I understand that obviously they're running their P&Ls in a way so that they understand what's profitable, but it would be cool to be alive to see that Sounder station in South Tacoma being used in a way where you could actually go up to Seattle and down to South Tacoma and downtown on a, on a train that doesn't, you know, like that's comfortable. Um, I went up for a Sounders game with my friends for the first time on it, and I was like, this is so much fun. We like snuck some drinks on there, you know, it was, it was great. You know, and I was like, I wanna do this more yeah, often, yeah. but a lot of times you take it up, you can't take it back, you take it back, you can't take it up, because it's a commuter train. It's not for nightlife, it's not for uh, the weekends, really. It's really just for people that are waking up early and coming home after work. So it would be really cool to see the city develop to the point, I'm also t terrified, even not as a, as a long-term local of like the city changing into something that it, you know, it isn't, you know, in an inauthentic way. I think that that's why I'm off Seattle, is that it, it it's changed in very inauthentic ways. They tear down whole blocks and just build everything new, you know, two, three times in my lifetime. And it's, you know, it's what I like about Tacoma and it's what I love about South Tacoma is that I feel like we're trying to sustain these old buildings and maintain them. Um, so can we have that and still have enough going on where that train stations or all these train stations could be getting used so that we could be, you know, because I there's a lot in Seattle that's really great, but I don't want to drive up there. It's awful. That and look, I live up there and commute. <laughs> I understand, brother. It's, it's, it's literally the worst 30 miles of highway anywhere in the country. So basically, this has turned into a really extreme policy conversation about public transportation <laughs> and trains and mistakes of the 70s. Um, or so I think. I'm younger than that, guys, but I look back and wonder. Um, great answers, thank you. So, sort of re related to that, um, from Chris, who I know is here, from Tacoma Aroma of Labor. Woo! She has to, yeah, great supporter of the local restaurant industry. If you don't follow her on Instagram, you should. Um, little plug for you there, Chris. <laughs> um, been doing it for a lot, a lot longer than I have, so. Um, she asked, what would, you like to see from local governments, from whether it's the health department, similar entities, what can they do more of, less of, to help an industry like the restaurant industry? And I think to a certain extent, small locally owned businesses thrive. Anybody feeling in Tiana? <laughs> And I don't know if this is, a whole, I, I, oh gosh, it's kind of a double-edged sword there. <laughs> Health department, I think. Um, so you guys familiar with the new system that they have going, like the, you get like a sticker kind of in your window. Do you have that with, do you guys have food? Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I'm not a, a I, I understand the process of that. I'm not a true believer in that system though. I think for me as a small business owner, the health department, the government, that kind of thing is making it easier for us to do our jobs, which the health department, I believe, is really good at that. Unfortunately, I think they've been impacted as most government offices have been um, as far as their ability to do their job. And I don't know kind of where they are with all of that, but I would like to 
have more hands-on. I feel like they're pretty absent right now. Anyway, that's just a thought <laughs> on that. But I don't, I don't, I don't know how I'm. I've had my head down for the last 22 years, is keeping my business going. So I'm, I'm not um, real familiar as far as government systems and all that stuff. How you know how they really can help. They've. Uh, I can say during our shutdowns, the county really stepped up and did some good programs for us um, that helped me dramatically. So. Um, being there for us when things do impact our business um, in a negative way and just making it easier for restaurateurs and employees and stuff to function our, in our jobs and educate and all that stuff. So I think that's um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to piggyback on that. I think that the health department is kind of like laying a, a good platform, especially um, just with how things are moving and staffing. We're getting a lot of new faces and um, kind of unseasoned industry people, uh, if that makes sense to, to most industry folks here. There's some people that, that are freshly new that want to cook or bartend. Um, and some people that have been here a few years or longer, but we're seeing a lot of new faces and people don't understand like the proper way to run a kitchen. And we're evolving of how to teach that. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the health department has been stepping up and kind of like giving us a good platform. I mean, the sticker's new. I think if anybody's seen the bear, anybody seen the bear on Hulu? Yeah. All right, you see when they got that sticker. Yeah. All right, well, it's, 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 yeah, it's nerve wracking because you don't want to, you know, we know good colors. Green is good, yellow's all right, red is like you're doing something bad. Yeah. So like, it, you know, it's one of those things that keeps on our toes, but it also gives these younger, these younger people who are hungry for what we're doing and people have been here to, uh, an opportunity to like, um, have some steps to, to, to climb up on and, and kind of see the proper way to do it and either, you know, take that and do something big here, or move on, do something elsewhere. Um, and, I, and I think that's pretty cool, because normally the health department just show up and you just get dinged for a bunch of stuff you had no idea about, like, well, I didn't, you know. Yeah. And But now they're more lenient, they'll come in, they'll talk to you, they'll suggest something, um, they'll show you, and rather than like, um, most places, you know, or places I've been, they'll shut you down. They'll give you an opportunity to like, correct those mistakes, learn, um, be better. Um, and I think that's pretty dope. Yeah, um, just, just as far as restaurants, people count you out first time in, um, just kind of all aspects. So have the opportunity to just like, you know, they're, 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 they want us to succeed is, is what I'm trying to say. And like, I think that's dope rather than coming in and like, you know, we're already having a day that they don't know about because we don't show the stress, right? Right. And then they, you know, I'm like, oh, you gotta, did you, you know, you touch that piece of cheese <laughs> in your glove, had a tiny, you know, I don't know, but stuff, you know, that's like, it's just like, come on, you know, but um, a lot more lean, I think COVID, and uh, open that up to like you know people to just give each other a break and like yeah like you're not enemies yeah we're not enemies you know, you know there should be a common ish, goal you know nobody wants to see the health department walk in for a service it's like great you know that's that's nerve-wracking uh so but you know end of the day it's a learning curve for school so wonderful um so i'm just going to ask one more question and then hopefully leave a little bit of time for a couple live ones um this is something that i was going to ask and i had several people who registered ask this question in advance too and this again is for anybody who wants to chime in all three of you if you'd like uh what's missing from tacoma's food scene what do we need more of what do we need less of what <laughs> chris is laughing <laughs> Like, do we need more sandwiches? No, I don't know. Um, what do we need more, whether it's cuisine or style or price points or anything? We just need more people. Um, more people, like what is it? Yeah, it could be people, more people to come to your place, more people to work at your place. Like, what do we need and, and where, where is it all going? Where do you guys see it going in a few years? I'll, I'll say th this is kind of bringing it back to COVID a little bit, but the one thing that we lost during COVID that I really miss is like the late night and 24 hour stuff. Yes. And I'm really looking for, forward for that to come back. Like there were pho restaurants in South Tacoma where you could get pho until, I mean, these places were packed. If you've never done bones and masa? Oh yeah, three oh, o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, these pho restaurants were full of people and we you know, we would work until three in the morning and go get late night pho and now they're all closing at midnight or even earlier than that. A few of them are starting to get going again. But I know with the late night diners, the twenty four hour diners, like a lot of this and I don't 
I don't know if that was because it wasn't profitable beforehand, or if it's become not profitable now, or if it just is, you know, some combination of fear, hesitation to, you know, to make those moves. But uh, in a dream world, that's what I would like to see come back is the availability of like late night and 24 hour uh, culture. Do you think it'll ever, yeah, hallelujah to that, right? Especially if you're like a night out, I'm a night owl and it's, I mean, it's hard to find somewhere to eat even after like 8.45 p.m. and you'll go into a place and they'll turn, <laughs> Jack in the box. <laughs> speak no evil in here. Uh, <laughs> um, but now it, it feels like, it feels almost like an elusive chase that you're never even, I, sometimes I wonder if it, like if we just, if the whole, if we turned a corner and we're never going back. So I, so for me, I know the impacts on my business still post, you know, it's because we lost a lot of people in this business. We lost some really good chefs. We got, we lost some really good restaurants. And so now we have an issue with staffing that's huge. We have, you know, a product that we still don't know if we're going to get. So that insecurity is still very strong. So my hope and my dream is, you know, eventually we'll, because we're just kind of, we're still, you know, baby steps. At least that's my experience. I have less tables, I have less chairs now than I did because of staffing. Um, I haven't changed my menu as dramatically as I typically do because of our supply issue problems. Um, so I think once we shake out of some of the repercussions of what we've all been impacted by, that eventually we'll start getting back to that. Hopefully, you know, because I think we're all missing some of that good stuff that we had that was going so strong in Tacoma. We were killing it. We were killing it. And I, we still have the people that want it, right? So once the systems start improving and we get people that want to get in and, and cook, you know, I, want, I, I would just love to have more people to show how to cook. Um, that's my passion. This business is a business, but I started it because food is a passion of mine. And so I'm looking for those kind of people that have that kind of same passion that want to come alongside me. So God willing, <laughs> you know, those faux places. I guess yeah. to kind of connect your two questions is like, you know, what I guess what we could see is we could start seeing, you know, what I'm hearing from you because I don't really have a kitchen. Like we, we, we always had a light menu and we even gutted it even further. But like from an outside perspective, hearing what you're saying is that the state can start viewing what you do as a cultural thing that can be supplemented with, you know, with, with funds, like, like, like an arts community. Because what we really need is we need people to get back into the kitchen and cook. And basically what we're all kind of all saying is that we don't have enough money to give the people enough money to come back, right? And they, and they want more now, which they deserve to ask for. So this is a crisis where you're going to have chain restaurants or the ones that are surviving and the rest of us exactly. are the ones that are failing, you know, or they're just, you know, like, and, and I feel, this is where I say, like, I blessed a lot, is like, I'm kind of insulated because of how small I am. I have one to two staff on at any time. And so, but from an outside perspective, hearing what you're saying and seeing it from my perspective and thinking about being busier, I could see that being a huge issue. And, and why, why can't the state see it as arts funding to create food, right, as opposed to, you know, murals or whatever, it, it can be supplemented. And that would build the culture. And food is definitely an art. I mean, that's, it's my art. Every day I go to work yeah. and, you know, it's, that got me through COVID. It got me prepping those dang to-go orders that I didn't want to do, oh, but, man. you know. <laughs> but I made some art in that. I did, like, 35 beef wellingtons went for Christmas Eve. It was insane. That's that Gordon Ramsay life right there. Oh, my the God. Beef, the beef wellies, oh. Put yeah, it yeah. down, baby. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Heard, heard. Uh, but, yeah. Um, I think for me, just, you know, you know, being from here, I, I'd like to say just stay with us as we, you know, embark on this new journey. Um, we want to stay open later. But just like everyone's saying, staffing and uh, those people who, who, who want it, you know, um, just as we were a few years ago and in our careers, like that passion and that drive, we're looking for those people. Um, and it is hard to find. You know, a lot of people are scared off by um, the lifestyle that comes with, you know, a restaurant. And it's, it's, it's a tough life. It's a long day. It's, you know, it's long days. It's, you know, you never know how long or early. Um, so just stay with us, you know. We, we want to be open for you guys. We're open as... 
much as we can. We're packing as much as you can, but we also want to keep you guys safe. Um, so, you know, I think that's already been proven. People understand that, hey, we can, maybe can, you know, fit your table five, table six. We don't have the staff or the space or the chair or the capacity or, you know, we're just, we're just upright, you know, pushing our limit. Um, so yeah, just stay with us as we're all going through these developments, going through these changes, um, figuring out what's the new normal. Um, other than that, you know, far as Tacoma, I, you know, I love to see you guys out to trying new things. There's plenty of restaurants that are popping up, plenty of restaurants that have been here. Um, adventure out, see what they're about. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, takeout or it's a coffee shop or sandwich. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need more anything. We need more of just each other. Um, far as like, you know, speaking from Tacoma, man, just, yeah. But um, yeah, um, that, that's all we ask from you guys is just to understand and like um, take to, you know, to be with us as we're taking our time to do it right and do it proper and give you guys what you need. And um, you know, we'll, we'll only move further from there, so. I just wanted to add one more thing as far as an employer because I, you know, I, I got, I'm the chef and I'm an employer and I, so I balance all these things. What is intriguing for me and I'm still waiting for an answer for that is, you know, I, this thing that's going through my mind is sustainable staffing, you know, and because quality of life means so much and I, so I'm in search of that perfect scenario because it is long nights, it is long, you know, it's, this sense of urgency you have to have in the, in the restaurant industry because you don't know from when you, you got to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So for me, it's an exciting piece of the puzzle that I don't have an answer to, but I'm looking for earnestly. And um, I'm hoping that because we often get stuck in our kitchens and our bars and we don't get to communicate with each other. And that's what I'm in search of, is how can I maintain a staff that feels, you know, I, I'm sure you probably feel that way too, that feels like this is a safe place for them to come and learn and grow and work. And, you know, it, it, the best thing about a kitchen or a restaurant, I fell in love with it when I was a kid, is the camaraderie that you have in a restaurant, in a kitchen. It's, to me, it's just a fascinating um, team kind of feeling. And you just work your ass off, and it's just it's a good thing at the end of the day to feel like, God, I did that, and people are happy, and you watch these people enjoy what you're doing. That just is so amazing. So making people aware that that's what we do. The hours might be difficult sometimes, but most bosses, especially in small places, care about you. Um, we care about the employees. We care about their quality of life, too. But we also have to be a team to make sure that we take care of those customers that walk through the door so that we can all go about our lives, you know, and do whatever it is that we want to pursue. So I, I'm just excited about that because I keep, I, I know there's an answer and I'm searching for it and I know I'll find it because I'm not going to give up. I'm pretty stubborn that way. But, <laughs> but if anybody knows one, let me know. <laughs> Such a, I actually, that's such a positive note to end on. I don't know where else I could, where else I could end except from what y'all said. So thank you everyone for being here. I hope it was insightful and interesting and there's enough people here that I'd say we could do this again sometime. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Sam, Jacob, Tiana, if you haven't been to their place. <laughs> Thank you also to my folks at the News Tribune for helping me put this on. Yeah. Tony and Cheyenne over there. Yeah, everybody. Um, and thanks to Odin for hosting. And I hope you all had fun. And if you have any questions for us, like I'm sure they'll be happy to hang around and chat. Um, us, me too. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And yeah, we'll see you, you next thank time. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you.